So within the um, zero emission flight delivery group, we only um, established this about 18 months ago. And that is really looking um, kind of at three areas, looking at the aircraft technology um, to get to zero emission flights so and new technologies like hydrogen, like electric flight, looking at the infrastructure that's required. So I think we recognise that airports and airfields are going to need to have quite a dramatic change to be able to accommodate things like hydrogen and electric as well as kerosene and SAF. And then also the regulation. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive, if you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. My guest today is Rachel gardner Poole. Rachel is the chair of the Zero Emission Flight Delivery Group at the Jet Zero Council in the UK. It is a very interesting role which brings together multiple parties from the government to the industry and academia working to make zero emission flight a reality in the UK. In the past, Rachel has arranged visits to Airbus factory in Bristol for these members, has pulled together the groups across multiple teams and departments to align on the same vision. Rachel and I discuss in depth what it takes for a country, not just an organization, to help aviation to get to net zero. And I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed recording it on our boat studio in London. Rachel, it's good to be finally meeting you in person, speaking with you on the river here. I've heard so much about your work. Tell us a little about the Jet Zero Council and the zero emission flight groups that you're leading and part of. Sure. And it's really, really great to be here. And it is an absolutely beautiful location. I think you need a bit of a video going on as well to show where you're situated. So if I just talk about set back to the Jet Zero Council. So the Jet Zero Council was established back in 2020 and um, very deliberately to be a kind of collaborative group with government and industry and academia, all looking at how we get to net zero by 2050. So kind of the different areas to actually drive us forward on sustainable aviation. And who led this? Was this by the UK government? Yes, so it's the UK government. It's actually led by Department for Transport, but currently we've actually got three secretaries of state. So that's the most senior level of government who chair that. So it's actually three government departments, and the lead being Department for Transport, then DESNES, or the Department of Energy, Security, and Net Zero, and also the Department of Business and Trade as well. That's interesting. Did you say Department of Net Zero? I don't know if any other country has that. Yeah, so it's a more kind of newish um, government department that's been set up. But yes, it's the Department of Energy, Security, and Net Zero, and it was set up, I think it was last year. Okay, and what's your role at Jet Zero Council? So within the Jet Zero Council, there are two delivery groups to kind of progress the work. And so I chair the um, Zero Emission Flight Delivery Group. The other delivery group is the Sustainable Aviation Fuels Delivery Group, and that's chaired by Jonathan Council from IAG, who I think you had on the show Absolutely. last year. Absolutely. He was sitting in the same exact hot seat you're in now. <laughs> Good. So, yes, yeah, so within the um, Zero Emission Flight Delivery Group, we only um, established this about 18 months ago, and that is really looking um, kind of at three areas, looking at the aircraft technology um, to get to zero emission flights so and new technologies like hydrogen, like electric flight, looking at the infrastructure that's required. So I think we recognize that airports and airfields are going to need to have quite a dramatic change to be able to accommodate things like hydrogen and electric as well as kerosene and SAF. And then also the regulation. So I have to say I've kind of lived in several continents and everywhere I've lived in working with aviation people always blame the regulator <laughs> so we don't want to do that I used to work for the regulator and um, we want to ensure that regulation is not a blocker and actually is helping us shape this as we move forward so those are the kind of three subgroups that sit within the zero emission flight delivery group they've each got a chair to progress those elements 
Okay, it's, it's very interesting. And you're leading this group, both of these yes, working exactly. groups. Yes, exactly. Um, let's talk about money and budget because, you know, you're coming mm-hmm. you know, from a government perspective. The figures are anywhere from 4 to $5 trillion uh, that is needed to decarbonize aviation by 2050. I believe the UK government has pledged £685 million pounds in funding. Is that enough? Where's the rest going to come from? What's the role private players will play? How, how are we going to fund decarbonization? Yeah, so that figure often gets quoted, but it's actually only a kind of a small piece of the pie of government funding. Um, So that 685 was actually for a three year period to actually fund the Aerospace Technology Institute program. So it's the ATI program. And that program was set up kind of as a collaborative thing to work with industry where it's part government, part industry funded to really drive through um, and ATR is essentially looking at how we grow aerospace in the UK, as well as with having the sustainability aspect as well. So that was really covering a three-year period. Um, last year, the government committed to a further, it's almost a billion, I think it was 900 and something million pounds, almost a billion um, on the ATI program. And of course, that figure doesn't account for the funding that had gone in previously to the ATI program, which has been running for 10 years as well, which is ultimately then going and working with industry. So I said, that's on one side of things. I mentioned earlier on about the two other government departments. So that bit comes under the Department of Business and Trade. Then you've got the Department for Transport. And they are also investing in quite a lot of things to do with SAF. So, for example, to ensure that we have um, SAF plants um, set up in the UK by, well, um, being built in the UK from 2025, five SAF plants. And with that, the Advanced Fuel Fund as well, which I think is about 185 million And there's been funding as well looking at um, how we kind of have the infrastructure set up at airports. There's also been um, funding about looking at things like non-CO2 as well. So there's kind of a number of different funding mechanisms that come from government. But I think the 685 is probably the most famous one, which is why it gets quoted. Got it. Okay. thank you so much for adding some light to that (laughs) number and some context. I want to dig into something you just mentioned. Five SAF plants by 2025 built in the UK? Is that what you said? No, sorry, I should have said a five initially initiated from 2025. Oh that makes a bit more sense. <laughs> yes, that would be quite an impressive achievement if we actually managed to complete and have five SAF plants running by 2025. Right. So while we're on SAF, it is clear from the orders we got at Dubai Air Show, Paris Air Show, Singapore Air Show that. A lot of the aircraft that are being built today will continue flying 30 years from now in 2050, 2054 to be specific. To decarbonize these, SAF is the only option. What's the big bet that the Jet Zero Council is making on SAF? So um, SAF is part of, I'd say, not the only, I'd say it's part of the um, options. So there's two things I'll mention. First of all, what the UK government is doing on SAF um, so I already mentioned about the commitment about five um, SAF plants being under construction by 2025. There's also the SAF mandate, um, which is being introduced in 2025, which will insist that kind of at least 10% of jet fuel will be from sustainable sources by 2030. Um, and then they also have already um, established a SAF clearinghouse, which is kind of essentially will support the testing and approval of these kind of new innovative type fuels as well as this year they'll be looking at implementing a revenue certainty um, mechanism as well to help kind of build that long-term supply so as well as I mean you will see in the press there's a lot of different partnerships that are being set up you know you've got British Airways and Lanzajet I think just this week Airbus and Total Energies have signed a SAF partnership so all of this kind of stuff is happening around SAF. But going back to your original point about SAF being the only option for these new aircraft, I think the other thing that people often don't realise um, or forget about is how much improvements have already been made in the actual kind of aerodynamics, the engines of aircraft that actually make them much more efficient. So, I mean, McKinsey did some research, um, which just to this point, you know, from t- 2005 to 2019, um, 39% of kind of fuel consumption per passenger had actually, you know, reduced by 39% during that period. And that was just a 2019. And half of that was due to things like better materials, lighter materials, improvement in engines, improvement in aerodynamics. So when you look at that, 
when you look at all the kind of new aircraft that are coming out, they're even more efficient. So I think it's not just, certainly not just under staff for those aircraft. A lot of the efficiencies is in the actual aircraft structures as well. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of uh, work being happening that's ha- that's been happening on the materials, on the operational efficiency side of things. And yes, the per passenger carbon footprint is going down, but we know airlines are growing and airline is, um, you know, airlines pollute basically mm-hmm. and when they grow overall carbon emissions increase and i think that's a balance that's going to be a tough one to strike where yes per person carbon emissions are going down yet overall emissions from the sector are increasing and when you add the context that other sectors are decarbonizing faster from shipping to textiles to steel then the overall contribution from aviation to the mix of emissions in 2050 is going to be much larger than what it is today. Do you see this conversation happening in the boardroom? So is this something that you are addressing as part of Jet Zero Council? Yeah, so two things. I mean, when you look at the kind of focus now of aviation on decarbonization, I mean, it's massive. You're seeing more and more airlines, organizations having, you know, sustainability kind of at the executive level, at least, you know, the next level down. So there's a massive, massive focus on that. We've really noticed that over the last few years. Um, certainly the Jet Zero Council, um, you know, supports the Jet Zero strategy, which was released by the Department for Transport um, two years ago. And then they did it for an update last year. And essentially what that says is that we need all several different elements to actually reach net zero by 2050. So part of it is SAF, part of it is the kind of aircraft improvements and with that comes some of the operations which I know Carrie Harris talked about on the podcast you know what they're doing in um, BA in terms of even things like taxing on single engine or um, you know with airspace as well and um, then it's the new technologies so kind of hydrogen um, aircraft electric aircraft moving forwards um, there is also looking at kind of removing carbon so carbon capture essentially removing it from the air as well as well as looking at compensating the non-CO2 effects as well. So it's a whole range of different things, which the Jet Seller strategy kind of shows that if we do all of those things, we would get to net zero by 2050. Let's talk about this uh, mix of options. We spoke about SAF. What about new technologies? There's hydrogen aircraft, there's electric aircraft. Are these going to play a fringe role? Or do you foresee, especially in the UK and Europe, these electric and hydrogen aircraft playing a big role? So I think they will play a big role, but it's much longer game. You know, I think hydrogen aircraft, you know, we will expect to see those in the next few years, certainly kind of more for short haul and kind of smaller, kind of more like 19 seater aircraft. I know, you know, you've had Zero Avia on this um, show as well. Um, And certainly in terms of designing and creating longer aircraft, you're looking at much longer time frame but I think the expectation is once we get to that point you know which might be you know longer term we're talking like mid 2030s and beyond by that time you know hydrogen you know once it is being used you know it will be cheaper and but we appreciate the complex challenges you know it's not just about the aircraft technology it's the infrastructure that goes around it as well as well as public perception too. So two threats to build on there there is Zeravia uh, I've visited them in the Cotswold. I believe they have two thirds of their global staff in the UK. What led to that? Why aren't they all in California, for example? Yeah, so I actually asked, I saw someone at a conference on Tuesday who was part of the original team who set up Zero Avia, and I asked him that very question. And he said, you know, they did look at different options. Um, but one of the kind of key things was around the supply chain in the UK and what we in the UK can kind of bring. So, I mean, I've already talked about some of the funding, things like the Aerospace Technology Institute and some of the initiatives that are happening. But also the UK is quite a centre for innovation as well. So um, my last kind of up until last year, I was worked at Connected Places Catapult, which is one of nine catapults, which was set up by the government um, over 10 years ago, deliberately to look at how we commercialise innovation in the UK. So they were set up by government. They're not for profit. And they work with different industries. So the one that I was involved in was looking at cities, transport and place. There's other ones which are looking at high value manufacturing, one that's looking at energy. So, again, that's just an example of the, I suppose, government and therefore UK commitment to innovation and how we actually get that innovation off the ground and not just the ideas, but how you commercialise it, getting through that valley of death. 
that often means that SMEs end up kind of dying and not actually surviving. A side question on this. Uh, yes, the ecosystem that the UK offers is great. One of the most critical aspects of the ecosystem is funding. Volocopter. Mm-hmm. No, um, vertical aerospace. Mm-hmm. Sorry, vertical aerospace is also based in the UK. And I believe vertical aerospace, an eVTOL company, has access to a lot of taxpayer funding as well. Is that something common? Do you foresee that innovations in the technology space and aviation space will have access to taxpayer funding? Yeah, I mean, that is, again, part of the kind of overall government strategy is to try and increase innovation in the UK. So I think there's a number of different things that are happening. And yeah, Vertical, again, is as well as Zero Avia, they're all part of the ZEF delivery group because we're trying to include all of these kind of new innovative companies um, and smaller companies, as well as some of the large ones like Airbus or Rolls Royce. Right. No, I'm I'm really glad to see the momentum you've been getting because this is a dream come true. You think about countries that focus on stuff like this, like Singapore and Ireland. And I think UK is leading the way uh, there on how do you attract and keep these companies. Um, Zero Avia, of course, is looking at hydrogen. There is also Cranfield Aerospace uh, Solutions. What's being done to introduce hydrogen infrastructure in the UK if we look beyond just the manufacturers? Yeah, so that is, I mean, I already mentioned the subgroup um, focused on infrastructure, which is really focused about um, looking at kind of the airfields very specifically and the infrastructure around that. But I appreciate things like hydrogen supply, you know, across the UK is a big challenge. So I'd say it's kind of more in the R&D phase at the moment, but certainly the government, so this was the DESNES, the Department of Energy Security Net Zero, um, they released some papers um, kind of in December, which showed the kind of government approach to the kind of transport um, of hydrogen, how that would work. There's also been a number of different um, kind of industry and collab and government kind of collaborative initiatives with this. And we've got things like the Hydrogen Capability Network. We've got the Hydrogen in Innovation Network, all similar names. Um, and, and the Hydrogen in Aviation Alliance, I think I've got those names right, which are all, again, looking at how we kind of start to, I suppose, not just commercialize hydrogen, but how we actually get that infrastructure across the UK to enable it to actually get to the airports as well. So let's talk about airports then. My understanding, this is a stat I heard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that if Heathrow is to support hydrogen aircraft, it needs to build a hydrogen storage terminal the size of Terminal 5. I'm not sure if that's right, but it seems right. It sounds massive. What do airports like Bristol or Edinburgh and others do to be ready for hydrogen infrastructure? Yes, I mean, that's one of the ones. Actually, Bristol is kind of part of the Hydrogen Southwest group, which is looking at, um, you know, partnering. I mean, I know they're partnering with other areas very specifically to look to do that. And I think really the only way to do this is to come up with kind of collaboration and have, you know, recognizing that it's not just aircraft that are going to need hydrogen in the future. Um, And it's kind of how do you kind of partner with whether it's ports, whether it's other um, capabilities, other sectors. Um, And we do this kind of much more collaboratively. I think that's the only way it's actually going to happen and essentially be commercially viable. And I have to ask you this. A lot of the flights, hydrogen flights, for example, out of Bristol might be to outside of the UK. You can have a Zero Avia aircraft fuel up with hydrogen in Bristol and land in a place like, let's say, Eindhoven or Amsterdam. And what if they don't have hydrogen? How do you get it back? So what... what are you doing in terms of international cooperation? Is there something there? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the individual organisations, I know are already kind of doing collaborations and setting up partnerships, Zero Avia being um, one example. But again, within the ZEF delivery group, we recognise the international thing was so important. So we've set up, we've called it a task finish group. In other words, it's got a start and an end, but deliberately to look at that. So they're working with, they've got members of, you know, government in that group, as you'd expect. Um, but looking at, first of all, what is happening around the world, just trying to get, understand that and then really looking at how do we position the UK and what are the actions we'd need to take to actually make this viable internationally and not just, you know, we can't just have flights flying in the UK. Right. You, you can't buy a one-way ticket exactly. on, on a hydrogen exactly. aircraft. You have to come back. Um, we spoke a lot about SAF, hydrogen, electric. What about non-CO2 emissions? I believe the UK has companies like Satavia, 
There's a lot of work being done out of uh, Cambridge University, the Whittle Lab. How is the Jet Zero Council supporting the non-CO2 research and work that's been done? Yeah, so it's interesting. When I set up the Zeph Delivery Group, you know, 18 months, two years ago, you know, as I was meeting with different people and kind of selecting who would be on different groups, I would ask them what their biggest challenges were, three biggest challenges. And one of the things that kept coming out was non-CO2. And there was a real drive to do something on that. So under the Jet Zero Council, what's happened um, again kind of last year was actually setting up a non-CO2 task finish group. So with a very kind of clear scope to work until kind of the end of this year on four um, very specific areas. Um, but to actually get to that point, we ended up having a kind of an away deal with 50 representat representatives from both industry and a lot from academia as well. There's a lot of research that's gone into this. And that was really productive because in the end, you know, in the afternoon, you really identified the four key areas to focus on non-CO2. I mean, that one is focused quite a lot on contrails, but there's other non-CO2 effects as well. So that's kind of kicking off and there's four work streams within that. Do you see some challenges or pushbacks on non-CO2 or contrail work? Um, so only in the sense that some, so there have been kind of some thoughts that we need to understand everything about it before you know there's there's the risk of you know going ahead with hydrogen or going ahead with other new technologies and it actually having a bigger impact or worse the impact as a result of the non-co2 effects so i know there are you know there are some who believe we need to do kind of more research before you kind of make any decisions on things um certainly you know my view is that we kind of need to press ahead and i think some of the work that we're doing on the non-co2 task finish group will help kind of get that consensus all right well i'm um, i wish you all the best because i know it is a contentious topic uh for sure let's go back to funding i know we started with, with funding let's come back to that my understanding is a typical startup technology startup would need in excess of a billion dollars to raise to be raised to be successful for entry into service yet there are companies like faradair another uk startup which has not manage to raise the necessary funds or do a prototype, for example, which some other companies have. What do you think is hindering some of the other startups and how do you think you can enable them to succeed? Yeah, it's a, it's a really um, good point. And in fact, that whole commercialization of zero emission aircraft is something that I you know, see as a really important thing. Within the Zeph Delivery Group, we've actually recently started a you know commercialization task finish group but we're looking to turn that into a subgroup because we recognize the importance of it and they've been looking at kind of what the barriers are to commercialization and then what the actions we could take so that's kind of one angle um but it's interesting i asked this question i happened to catch up with a um, investment banker friend of mine who's not from the uk um he was visiting here and i asked him that question and it was it's interesting because you know i you know certainly i hear kind of hundreds of millions and you think that's a massive amount of money. He only deals in hundreds of millions. He wouldn't touch anything less. You know, it's in his world, it's more like billions that he's talking about. But the, you know, conversation that we had was around the fact that, you know, it's as soon as something becomes commercially viable, his view is that you're never short of funding. There's always funders. There's always investment bankers. There's always, um, you know, venture capitalists who will fund it. It's getting to that point of commercialization is, that is the real challenge which again is, you know, why setting up this um, task finish group under the ZEFDG. So um, I've mentioned already some of the things that the government have been doing and do do in the UK, you know, whether it's through the catapults to help get that early stage, that R&D stage, that getting to a demonstrable, commercially viable prod um, product, which is so important to be able to enable that funding. When you say commercially viable product, is this... A paper design, which is how Hart Aerospace in Sweden raised their initial funding. Is this uh, something like a test aircraft, which is what Zero Avia is doing? What does this commercially viable product look like? Yeah, it's a really good point. So, I, I mean, I was thinking of commercially viable as in actually it's ready to go. So that was what I was meaning in terms of um, that level. You know, I wasn't going to go to technology readiness levels, but that's what I was thinking of when I said that. The other thing I will say is that I think there's more and more investors and high net worth individuals who do want to focus on kind of green technologies. It's almost the, you know, it's the cool thing. It's the good, you know, it's the right thing to do. And um, there's quite a lot of um, organizations who, you know, want to have that positive impact. And they're not just interested necessarily in investing and making money. They want to have a positive impact as well. Right. 
I mean, it's so fascinating, fascinating, the journey. There will be those who succeed. There will be those who don't. What do you think are the key levers for airlines to get to net zero? Should they be investing in these technologies? We've seen, for example, British Airways and Lanza Jet or Nova Pangea and these partnerships coming through. But they are trickling through. It's not like the floodgates have opened. What can airlines do differently to accelerate their journey to net zero? Yeah, so I mean, again, it comes back to what I was saying before. It's the kind of multifaceted approach. I really do believe that. I don't think if we just focus on one thing, um, I think Jonathan in his um, podcast talked about diversification strategy for IAG. And I think, you know, that is very sensible. That's a sensible thing when we're dealing with so many unknowns of the future, which is, you know, true in life um, and so much change. I think the rapid change of technology growth is huge at the moment. Right. It's It's very fascinating. Now, one of the things I've seen you do very successfully as part of the Jet Zero Council is you bring people together and you take down these full day workshops, like one which was held at in Bristol at Airbus. Uh, tell us a little about this. What exactly happens in these? Why are you doing this? What is the outcome? Yeah, so I mean... Um... I start with the Zeph Delivery Group, which is about 20 people. Um, We do try and meet in person. You know, we have the option to dial in. And that was something I was really keen to do from the out, you know, from the outset. Because I think, you know, there's a lot about, you know, building relationships and getting trust. And we always try and arrange a tour of a facility or you arrange something. Um, So we've been trying to do that where possible. And I know the subgroups have done something similar as well. So what we did, which was um, the first time we did it was last October, we pulled together the ZFDG and the three subgroups, that's about um, 65, 70 people in total, who all came together um, at Airbus, who kindly hosted us, also provided us a tour of all their facilities, which was great. Um, and the purpose of doing that was to really make sure everyone was on the same page, um, get give it an opportunity for people to give feedback on how we can do things better. And then the other thing was in the afternoon session, we focused on kind of what are the next few years? We've already got a two-year plan for the Jet Zero Council, which ends this year. But what do we want to do over the next few years? But I think what was so great about that is, you know, Bristol, it's not convenient for everyone to get there. And everyone involved in the Jet Zero Council, including myself, is doing this voluntarily. So kind of no one's paid to do this. Um, And yeah, it was great. And these are kind of senior level, often senior level executives and getting that group of people together was just, you know, kind of phenomenal, you know, and a really, really good day. How often do you get together? So in that kind of group, that was the first time we've done it. So we probably would look to do it maybe, you know, once a year. I know we're looking at doing something joint with Jonathan's staff delivery group um, at the Sustainable Skies World Summit um, this year as mm. well. So that's another example. So trying to do these face-to-face, but being realistic that everyone has a day job as well. Right. If we are... Speaking a year from now, and we are popping champagne, what are we celebrating? Um, so I do think, you know, there's kind of massive progress on SASH in the short term. So I think that's going to be the easy one, you know, to see, um, you know, this time in a year from now, you know, hopefully we'll be starting to see the sites of the kind of five SAF plants in the UK, or at least, you know, know, you know, who they are and, and where they're going to be. Um and I think on the zero emission flight and technology side, I think um, having, you know, just seeing kind of more progress on there and having a real clear plan under the Jet Zero Council of what our next few years is going to look like. And then on non-CO2, certainly in the next year, we will have completed kind of those key work streams. So I'm looking forward to seeing good output from that. This is fantastic, Rachel. What does success look like for you from both your working groups that you're leading? Um, I mean, ultimately, it's getting to zero by 2050. (laughs) But, you know, whether we'll still be going by then is a a different thing. But that for me, um, the other thing I think is just continuing that collaboration and engagement so that we can advise government with a common voice. And, you know, that engagement from across industry, that diversity of thought, which really helps solve challenges. This is fantastic. I I don't think I've had anyone on the podcast who brings together so many players from government, industry, and is able to make progress and not just talk about things. So congratulations on all the progress you've had, and it's been a pleasure speaking. Uh, The final round of this interview is called the Rapid Fire Round, in which we get to know you a bit more personally. So I'll start with something simple. What's your favorite airline, Rachel? um, So the two that I've flown on the most throughout my career has been British Airways and Virgin. 
and so I'll, I'll say them and I think it's great you know shout out to BA for you know some of the work they're doing trying to publicize what they're doing to anyone who travels you know through the BA Better World I love the fact that you can actually select and you know in very simple terms understand SAF you know I've got my husband to watch it he's not into aviation at <laughs> all um, and he found it really interesting and fascinating. Is he still um, going to continue flying next to you? <laughs> <laughs> Despite you were dictating his IFE choices. Indeed, but he also actually we're on a journey um and I was listening to Jonathan's um part Jonathan Council's podcast on here and he found it interesting. I asked him partway through I said, "Oh, do you want me to turn over to the radio?" He goes, "No, this is really interesting. What next one can I listen to?" So he really likes your podcast. You well. and your husband listen to me <laughs> together. Okay. I was quite amazed as well. I yes. need to I need to add uh, in Apple Podcasts a romance tab uh, on this podcast as well which is not there until now. We were on a long car journey, but <laughs> hey. Okay. I hope it gave you something to talk about together. What's your favorite airport? Say say again. What's your favorite airport? Oh, airport. Um Do you know what? I would say I would say Perth in Western Australia. Wow, that's the first time someone on the show is mentioning Perth. Why Perth? So I had, it was also my favourite city where I lived. I lived there for about 14 months um, when I went many years ago um, to fly in college full time to get all my commercial pilot licences because at one point in my life I was going to go and fly in Africa. Um, and so as part of doing things like cross countries, you know, we would land at Perth International Airport, which was... Um, quite cool and it's just yeah it's first time I ever saw an A380 was taking off from Perth so yeah it's got a good few happy memories and it's very sunny there which is always good very sunny and indeed very sunny uh, what's your favorite book Rachel um, I say the bible stands the test of time okay good good one and all books all is gold uh, what's your favorite city Perth Perth okay you mentioned that favorite movie um, Armageddon and the reason for that is because it's about ordinary people going into space and um, many years ago again in 2008-2009 I applied for the European Space Agency astronaut program I didn't get it because Tim Peake got it I got it through I think to the second stage or something um, but yes so that film gave me hope that I still might make it to space wow and you still might you never exactly. know you never know uh, what is something you would like to learn um, so I would say the cello. So I was very musical growing up. I did a diploma at the London College of Music um, in the piano and I'd always wanted to learn the cello as a child. Um, my parents couldn't really afford one, but my dad found a flute in a junk shop and brought it home and said, hey, I found, I found something for you. I assumed it was a cello, it was a flute. He then did a great job of trying to sell all the benefits of carrying a flute around rather than a cello. So I learned the flute instead, but I've never ever learned the cello. Wow. Uh, what do you do in your free time? Do you play the flute? Do you fly the plane? Do you do something else? <laughs> exactly. So at the moment, yes, that is, that is time. I'd love to get back to music and flying a bit. Um, but I tend to spend spare time. I love traveling, visiting new places, somewhere I haven't been before especially new cultures um, and then I like exercise so when I'm not injured running swimming cycling gymming that kind of stuff fantastic we should all keep active that's great to know what is the best advice you've received Rachel um, actually from my parents uh, growing up which is nothing is impossible certainly seems so given that you've had some piloting escapades you applied to the European Space Agency you have um, aspirations to learn the cello you play the flute, you go running, and you're running, um, you know, to non-profit voluntary groups to decarbonization, uh, decarbonize aviation in the UK and beyond. So congratulations. This is very inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries, yet there are multiple paths to get to net zero. Awareness is key to a green future. So please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network, on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp, 
or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplifying that's simply with an i dot com. And for more content on sustainable aviation, please visit our website green dot simplifying dot com and join the movement. Sustainability in the air is an original podcast by Simplifying. The show is produced by Uri Toth in Slovakia. Dirk Singer is our director of sustainability, who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pal is our supervising editor, based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India and Mira Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show, based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore, and I am Shashank Nigam. the ceo of simplifying and your host please feel free to connect with me on linkedin